Capture over choice. Consent is my favorite word. It really is, because it's important. But back in ancient times, wasn't really a word anyone really understood. Thousands of years ago, couples skipped right over dating and instead went from captured to married. In fact, it was this idea that kind of sparked the origin of the honeymoon. A bride would be captured from a tribe, the tribe would go looking for her, and the thief would hide her away until they stopped. If you have watched the Spartan video on Bumblebee, if you haven't, go check it out, then you may know that their marriage ceremony centered on this as well, kind of, sorta, of, but it was, but consent was involved. As a way of courting, the women would wrestle to demonstrate their physical prowess and vice versa. They would watch the men as well and they would kind of simultaneously be like, yep, you. Then the woman's head would be shorn, they would dress them as a boy, and then they would be placed in a dark room and then wait for their betrothed to capture them and take them away. So very confusing there. I don't really understand it. But anyways, let's move on. Number nine, love letters. So nice. Today, it's easy to send a saucy text and an explicit pic to your partner or fling, or a person you're just friends with, but you know. Or the person you've been seeing for like half a year, but they're not your BF or GF, like no. Anyways, the rules are up in the air. But back then, you had to wait with bated breath to receive a thought out letter from your lover, filled with poetry and extravagant flirtations and little drawings. There are love notes between Anne Boleyn and Henry VIII. Henry even drew little doodles of a man depicted in lovesick sorrows. Anne then wrote back with drawings showing her talking to the angel Gabriel, being like, oh yeah, I'm gonna get a son. The Tudor version of the emoji. One of their exchanges went, and I quote, If you remember my love and your prayers as strongly as I adore you, I shall scarcely be forgotten, for I am yours, Henry Rex, forever. And then Anne's response was, Be daily prove you shall me find, to be to you both loving and kind. And then he cut her head off. How quickly the milk turned sour. But it was the way to play back then, and soon you'd have stacks of letters with declarations of love as you're heading to the chopping block with the guy beside you. Awful way to go. Awful way to go. Henry, you suck. Number eight, escort cards. Today, someone might ask you for you to give them your number so they can text you, you up at like 3 a.m. No, you're not, you're asleep because you have to work the next day. If you lived in the Victorian era, you may have dropped a calling card instead, or an escort card. Want to go on a date? Here's my card. It doesn't sound so romantic, but social calling cards didn't have your usual brick printing and beige background. Social calling cards were lavish, enticing, elegant, with bright colors and lush paper. If a man wanted to court a woman, he would hand her his calling card, which would not only include his name, but compliments to her. Kind of like a Valentine's Day card, but every day of the year. If a woman was the bee's knees and she was unmarried, she'd often return home with stacks of them. If she was particularly fond of one of them, she might take up the offer presented with the card, the offer of escorting a woman to and from a future social gathering. She would send her servant to deliver the news with her own calling card in response. This process was repeated several times and either amounted to something steady or flittered out. We all know what a ghosted text feels like, so I imagine this would be kind of the same. Number six, spoons. We talked about knives that fit their sheaths. Now let's talk about spoons. Spoons. Dating back all the way to 17th century Wales, suitors would give ornately carved love spoons. They would make it from a single piece of wood to show his affection to his intended. On the spoon, there would be engravings which would symbolize intention, i.e. an anchor, for instance, would mean I desire to settle down, and the vine would mean something like love. Love grows. Rural peasants used wooden spoons to eat and prepare food, so carving spoons to use every day was a usual chore. The most beautiful spoons were kept, therefore, to keep as gifts, to give to those you loved or wanted to. The better the spoon, the finer the details, the finer the craftsman, the better the husband, which signaled to the love interest that they were reliable and skilled. The tradition is not specifically unique to Wales, in fact, it happened in many Celtic countries. Number five, dating and dangerous. So fun fact, after the Victorian era, or and slash kind of during, going on dates was uh, 
scandalous, like pretty kinda ooh. The term date is a relatively new term. It was coined just before the turn of the century. George Ad wrote in the Chicago Record about young women filling up the dates in their calendar with rendezvous with young men and that was in 1896. In the 1900s it took a little bit of adjusting. This therefore set the term kinda date as women going on dates. In the 1900s this took a little bit of adjusting. A woman out alone with a man without a chaperone at night and not a courtesan? How scandalous! As more and more women started doing it, people weren't sure how to react. Law enforcement even got involved because they would see a woman alone with a man and be like, she's a woman of the night and then they'd arrest her or they would be confused. But either way, in the eyes of the law, dating kind of became a crime. Women making a date seemed like they were pulling something else, so sometimes it was illegal to date, though other times it was like, dude, just stop, we're trying to go get dinner. Leave us alone. Number four, the art of the fan. Ooh. Being entirely open about who you were pursuing could raise a lot of eyebrows and damage one's reputation. So nobles often had to code their advances behind the art of the fan, mostly women, actually all women. If you have ever seen Dangerous Liaisons, you may have noticed Glenn Close elegantly using her fan to seduce and manipulate gentlemen callers around her finger. And that really how it was. It was all a game only the cleverest suitors could decode. Carrying it in the right hand in front of your face? Follow me. Placing it on the left ear? I wish to get rid of you. With the handle to the lips? Kiss me. A society lady in the 18th century was expected to know how to elegantly handle and hold a fan. This also helped differentiate between social classes. So not only was it used to set up a secret meeting in the garden with your betrothed lover, it was also used to communicate gossip and information. Number three, classified ads. Today we have so many dating apps, it's dizzying. You can swipe left, you can swipe right for your dream bow, any which way you like, Hinge, Tinder, Bumble, is that all there is? Plenty of fish, I don't know. It may surprise you to learn that this wasn't the first time people tried it this way. Enter classified ads. Uh, or personalized ads. If you were desperate for love and knew your person was out there but you just hadn't run into them yet, you would make an ad. In 1722, a Bostonian took space in the New England Current to put out an ad for, and I quote, any young gentlewoman that is minded to dispose of herself in marriage to a well accomplished young widower and has five or six hundred pounds to secure to him by deed of gift, she may repair to the sign of the glass lanthorn in Steeple Square to find find all the encouragement she can reasonably desire." And unquote. It was written by a 16 year old Benjamin Franklin. Oh bless. Some would even put out ads that capture the attention of someone they saw in passing. Take for instance this 1748 printing calling for, and I quote, a lady genteelly dressed. This is to acquaint her that if she is disengaged and inclinable to marry a gentleman who was on that occasion is desirous of making honorable proposals. <laughs> so cute. And now we know that all those dating apps were just a matter of time. Number two, bedding ceremonies. Okay, so I can't, I can't. I can't think of anything I would like least in the world Ugh, than to have an entire room full of guests during one of those private moments in anyone's life, especially my parents. Ugh. Now first comes dating, or courting as it were, then comes marriage slash sometimes they would just skip over dating and just go right to an arranged marriage, especially if you were a noble. And then for a long time comes your aunts, uncles, and parents into the bedding chamber to watch the consummation. Yay! A crowd of people would be there up until the very last second when the curtains were drawn, cheering you on. <laughs> Someone even like offer advice, like don't do that, do this. Some even stayed well past. For instance, on the wedding night of the young King Louis XIII and Anne of Austria, they had two nurses in attendance to make sure the ordeal went down. But this wasn't just in Europe, this also happened in China in the early 1900s. Number one, Bundling. Probably one of the most awkward ceremonies ever to take place. As, except for that one. That's the worst. But this is specifically to do with before getting married. As we have gathered thus far, being young and in love, or just being in love in general, has never been too easy. Bundling was a way to make it easier, I guess. I don't know. This 17th century tradition involved having your beau invited over. The parents needed to approve it, of course, and then you were to spend the night sleeping next to each other 
bundled up to the neck or sometimes just the waist like in like a human sack and then you would sleep next to each other with a plank of wood in the middle. So romantic. The tradition was meant as a way to gauge chemistry between the two lovebirds. The two would get to know each other by talking and sleeping together only before engaging in marriage. If it didn't go well, then they wouldn't get married. If it did go well, so much so that they unwrapped each other like Christmas presents on Christmas morning, then they pretty much got married like as soon as possible. The tradition was pretty popular in Ireland, the rural United Kingdom, and the New England colonies from 16th century into the 18th, but a lot of Victorian ideals were completely against it. They were like, no, corset it up and no love. At number 10, Veil. Through this video, you will come to find out that a lot of the wedding traditions that we practice these days have some pretty messed up origins. We'll get through a lot of them throughout this list, but let's start off by talking about the bride's veil. These days, a lot of brides choose to wear a veil on their wedding day. With so many different styles to choose from, this accessory is known to add that extra little pizzazz, little spice to the look. But throughout history, veils were used for different things, some of them being a tad bit messed up. Just a smidge. The rather obvious reason for brides to wear a veil back in the day had to do with religion and staying modest. But this hasn't been the only reason for veils. In ancient Rome, brides wore veils because it was believed to be effective at warding off evil spirits. The most messed up reason for the veil though, at least in my opinion anyway, has to do with the wedding transaction, so to speak. Since back in the olden days, marrying your daughter off was seen as more of a transaction, brides would wear veils to cover their faces and they wouldn't be lifted until after they were proclaimed husband and wife so that the groom wouldn't be able to back out if he didn't like how his bride looked. Seems pretty messed up to me, but what are your thoughts on it? Tell us down in the comments. Number 9. When Doves Cry I've been to one wedding where they released doves, like actual real life doves, and I was like, do they actually do this? I couldn't believe my eyes. I didn't know it was a real thing. Why do we do this? Well, because doves mate for life, and they build a nest, and then they Netflix and chill until the end of their dove days. Sounds like perfect symbolism if I've ever heard it. Back in ancient Roman and Greek times, doves were often used as gifts from the bride to the groom. Pretty shitty gift if you ask me. Here's a bird that we now have to both take care of. The snow white ring neck dove is used by magicians. They can't fly too well, they don't have a homing instinct, whereas rock doves, the ones commonly used in weddings that we see fly away over Nana's head, they have a homing instinct for hundreds of miles, so they're perfect for the gig. But they couldn't be released during foul weather and they needed two hours before the sun sets in order for them to fly home. The wedding band has less rules than the doves. That's amazing, they're riders much smaller. If you were to catch one of these doves at a wedding, you were also allowed to keep it back in the day. Also, great hands. I don't know who's catching birds or why they want to keep it and put it in their pocket, but you do you. At number eight, best man. These days, the role of the best man normally goes to the guy who's closest to the groom, whether that's a brother or a best friend. But back during the time where women were married off like property, the role of the best man was very different and was all about protecting one's assets. Back then, bride napping was actually very common, so if there was someone else who wanted to marry someone who was already promised to another person, in, they might try and steal her away for themselves. Yeah, why? I don't know. This is where the best man came in. The best man's job was to protect the bride and if she was stolen, the best man would be the one to enter whatever battle or duel was necessary to get the bride back. The best man was literally there to be the best fighter. The best man was also there to watch over the bride to make sure that she didn't try and make a run for it herself. They really said, try to derail this wedding and see what happens. Number 7. A June Wedding As we're counting down this list slowly but surely, you've probably begun Begun fantasizing maybe about your own wedding one day. Maybe it's a beach wedding, maybe it's themed like a winter wonderland. Doesn't that sound cozy? It's your big day, get creative. They say the best month to get married is June, and from a Canadian point of view, I can absolutely agree with that. In ancient Roman times, however, getting married in June was a must, not just a thing you wanted to do. See, June was the month of the god Juno. They protect women in life when it comes to marriage and childbirth, so if it's between that and like, I don't know, Halloween, obviously we're gonna go with June. Better omens for sure. Another myth is that bathing was rarely done back then, so when majority of the population did finally you know, wash up at the end of May or beginning of June, that's often when it would happen. Everybody smelled nice, they felt good, and they wanted to celebrate. So it was perfect timing. 
Better get me while my pits smell good, you know? That's a myth, but I can also see it checking out. A June wedding in ancient Roman days was also done so that after a spring birth, the mother can quickly hop back into action and help with that summer's harvest. Maternity leave who? Never heard of her. At number six, hashtag twinning. You know how at weddings the bridesmaids are usually wearing matching outfits? Well, this tradition dates back centuries, though it has changed slightly over the years. Remember how I mentioned that people would sometimes try to kidnap the bride on her wedding day? Well, other than the best man and the groomsmen trying to play their part in protecting the bride from being taken, the bridesmaids also played a part in that too. The bridesmaids used to dress identically to the bride so that it would make it harder to spot her and therefore prevent anyone from kidnapping her. This practice dates all the way back to ancient Rome and feudal China and didn't really start to fade out of tradition until around the 1880s. These days you get a couple of gifts from the bride for being in her posse but back then you didn't get anything Thing, and you had to risk your safety for your girl Becky who doesn't even want to marry Jeff down the block. I don't know. Number five, a toast. My favorite part of a wedding has to be the speeches or the toasts. They're always way too long or too personal or you know what, just too depressing. Just way too sad, just tears. You're like, why, why are we talking about this? It's a nerve wracking part, even as a guest, just to get up randomly and be like, okay, look at me everyone, hi. No, I don't want to do that. Back in the 1800s though, only men were allowed to give these toasts. The oldest friend, the groom, the best man, and then the father of the bride. The whole thing would have been done in eight minutes. Guys suck at speeches. They're just like, uh, uh, a lot of ums, that's all I'm saying. Wedding toasts go back as far as the sixth century BC. When Greeks were getting married, the father of the bride would drink the first glass of wine just to make sure it wasn't poisoned or anything. Romans would also drop a piece of burnt toast into the wine in order to make the wine taste less bitter, hence the term toast. Yeah, now we get it. Yeah, wine was so bad back then, they had to use burnt toast crystal light just to get through the day. Yuck. At number four, transaction. I find it to be just a little bit messed up how before now, marriage was mostly about money or status and not about love. For a long time, people didn't get to choose who they got to marry and there was almost always some kind of monetary transaction involved in the wedding. This whole idea here is a reason for the traditional act of the bride's father walking her down the aisle and giving her away, so to speak. In the past, fathers of the bride and groom would come together to establish an agreement, like X amount of money for someone's daughter or whatever. Once that was set up, the wedding became a big deal to see if the transaction would actually go through and many precautions were put in place to make sure that no one backed out. One of those precautions was the act of the father walking his daughter down the aisle. This was done so that they stayed close to one another in the off chance that the groom or his family decided to back out. That really took the romance and sparkle out of weddings now. Number three, wedding cake. As the youngest of three, I can confirm that we get away with the most. The youngest often do. The middle child is just plain ignored, and then the oldest, well, they usually have the most responsibility in the family. Usually when a bride and groom cut the cake on their big day, it's for them. They save a piece till their anniversary, they put it in their partner's face, it's fun, whatever they want to do. Often in history, the eldest child would get the first slice. How lucky is that? When it came down to cutting the actual cake too, well, that meant that the bride is no longer a virgin. It's an awkward few bites. Wedding cakes today are delicious and they're pretty much an art form. TV shows are devoted to them, like Cake Boss and other cake shows that I can't think of. If you're lucky, you might find a few cake charms on the inside as well back in the day. Real, non-edible cake charms. You wanted to find these in your cake. They brought good omens to the table. To find a rocking chair meant that you were going to live a long life. An anchor means you're bound for adventure, sailors ahoy. And a purse meant that you would have good fortune. Let's just hope you didn't find the charms with your teeth or else you would be using said new fortune fixing your chiclets. Very metal, very real. <laughs> Not good. At number two, plague flowers. In a lot of weddings, the flowers are very important. There's the flowers for the centerpieces, the bouquets for the bride and bridesmaids. There's flowers everywhere. Get your Benadryl. But why is that? Well, the idea of carrying a bouquet at a wedding dates back to ancient Greece where it was believed that carrying a bouquet was thought to ward off evil spirits, but a little later on down the line, the presence of bouquets at weddings got a little bit darker and a little more precautionary. During the Middle Ages into the Renaissance, when the Black Death was running rampant throughout Europe, people were trying anything and everything to try and ward off the plague. Back then, people believed that smells carried contagion, so people would 
would fill their pockets with fragrant things to keep the plague at bay. This was later integrated into wedding practices and brides started carrying around a bouquet of stinky stuff like garlic and dill to protect them from catching anything. Over the years, the stinky stuff was replaced with nice smelling flowers, but really, no one cares what's in the bouquet anymore because all people want to do is participate in the wedding hunger games and fight to the death to catch the bouquet at the end of the night. Why? Why are we hurting each other for this? Why? And finally, number one, wedding rings. One ring to rule them all. Perhaps the most important piece of the wedding puzzle, rings. Whenever somebody is about to pop the question, everybody around them always needs to see the ring. Congrats, let me see the ring. Oh my God, is it this, is it this? Egyptian pharaohs first used rings to represent this eternal life. The circle has no beginning or ending. They created this concept that we adore to this day. The center of the ring was also believed to be the gateway to the unknown. Finger just disappears, you're like, what the f These Egyptian Ouroboros rings were the first, a snake eating its own tail, hashtag love. When Greeks came in the picture, they took this tradition, started using copper and iron rings in ceremonies, and the iron rings had a key symbol on them, meaning that the wife now has control of the house. If you like it, then you should have put a key on it. Come medieval times, the ring gets another upgrade. Now we have these precious gems to be added to them. A little bit more glam. Rubies symbolized passion, sapphires symbolized the heavens, and diamonds to show strength. Because they were rock hard and obviously you know the rest. Come the 12th century, the Christian church declared marriage as a holy sacrament, so rings were solely used now for that ceremony. That's when the engagement ring came into place. There needed to be another trade or promise that was just as strong as a wedding band. So now there's rings for pretty much everything. Number nine. Today's weddings are in so insanely expensive. I don't know if it's ever gonna happen for me for that reason alone. But uh, you know, they kind of replaced the dowry altogether. But what was a dowry? It was a set of assets, money, material, goods, real estate that would be given to the groom once the couple united. The purpose of the dowry was to entice a groom to marry the bride if he wasn't already attracted to her. A kind of, we will pay you to marry our daughter kind of vibes. But it also acts as a kind of insurance for the bride. Should the marriage end in divorce, the husband is expected to pay it back. So yes, there were indeed take backsies if things got really bad. Though considering divorce and annulments were rare and the money really never belonged to her, not the best rule to live by, but the groom would also pay something called the bride price or bride wealth. The groom was expected to pay a sum, either in assets or money, to secure a lady's hand in marriage. This implied security for the bride and their family. But yes, in both accounts, technically, a bride could be bought and sold for whatever price the family slash groom deemed appropriate. So, really just a marriage pawn. On number eight, shotgun wedding. Marriage and weddings back in the medieval ages were practiced very differently compared to today. Back then, people started getting married and having kids very, very young. Usually, girls would be married off as soon as they hit puberty, so around the age of 12, and they would start popping out as many spawn as possible because the high infant mortality rate made it very difficult to grow a family. On top of the duty to further the population, these marriages weren't for love. Arranged marriages were the norm back then because it was mostly used to join families for status or alliances, or because your dad owed Billy from down the block a favor and he offered you to his son Billy Jr. Marriage ceremonies were also very different back then. Because marriage wasn't as big of a fuss as it is now, it didn't matter where you got married or how soon. You could get engaged in the morning and be married by lunchtime if you really wanted to. Most people didn't need permission to get married so they could hold the ceremony anywhere. Marriage ceremonies could be held in places like pubs, in the middle of the street, or even in bed. Because of this, it made it really hard to know who was married and to whom until the 12th century when it was declared a holy sacrament that must be observed by God. Number seven, no objections. So obviously, with a lot of people marrying willy-nilly, a lot of marriages mostly made people miserable. Maybe. Enemies to Lovers is my favorite book trope, so who knows how spicy things actually got. I hate you, I love you, next day, I don't know. But the famous line, speak now or forever hold your peace, only got introduced in 1215 to try and flesh out drama before they couldn't go back. In the Middle Ages, drama discovered after marriage vows were exchanged caused major problems since divorce wasn't easy or, you know, accepted. We will get to that later. 
For instance, Joan of Kent, who was known for marrying Edward the Black Prince and mothering Richard II, had a secret marriage when she was 12 years old. She didn't get approved. In her early teens, she was married to an aristocrat, but the secret marriage was discovered after eight years. The papal court had to overturn it and return her to her knight. He died 11 years later, and it was after that that her cousin Edward married her. Wouldn't it have been nice to know that little detail before she married the aristocrat guy? Yeah, probably. Would have saved a lot of heartbreak. Hence why the Speak Now or Forever Hold Your Peace was introduced. At number six, shoes. Back in the days of old, shoes were apparently a huge staple in society. They were pointy and weird and expensive and complicated and were even integrated into marriage practices. During the wedding ceremony, it was a tradition for the father of the bride to take one of the bride's shoes and give it to the groom. The groom would then tap the bride on the head with the shoe in a token of his authority. But the shoe traditions don't stop at bopping people on the head like little bunny foo foo. You know how these days there's a tradition of throwing the bouquet at weddings, and apparently whoever catches it is the next to get married? Well, that tradition sort of came from the medieval tradition of throwing shoes at weddings. Instead of throwing flowers, brides would throw shoes at their bridesmaids to determine who was next to walk down the aisle. Now this whole bride throwing things idea has failed me before because I caught a bouquet once and I'm as single as ever, so maybe someone needs to chuck a shoe at me or something this time. Please. Number five, the bedroom trial. So divorce, again, wasn't a thing. On the upside of dying early, it potentially meant that you weren't locked in a marriage for too long. If the marriage did end, it wasn't a divorce, it was an annulment, which was very expensive. A common reason this happened was due to consanguinity, which was close relations by blood or marriage, which was forbidden. Other grounds would be adultery, leprosy, and impotency. Also failure to concede to the marriage debt, which was the obligation for both spouses to engage sexually. It actually didn't matter where this happened. You had to do it even if it was in a church. It was a big deal. Enter the bedroom trial. Court cases from the 14th century show records that bedroom trials took place that would determine whether marriage should continue. The bedroom part is exactly as it sounds. The man and the woman were placed in a bed together and were to be watched by the wise women for several nights. If over the course of the night the man's member remains of no use, i.e. impotence, then it was determined that the marriage should end. But the wise women were most likely either complete strangers strangers or the groom's grandmother. So I doubt that would have helped with the getting it up part. Poor guys. At number four, marrying the country. If you married an entire country, does that count as polygamy? Are you technically married to everyone in the country or just the one country as a singular unit? These are the shower thoughts that I wish I could ask medieval queens, but unfortunately they died a long, long time ago along with their marriage secrets and probably some recipes for poison too. Back to this whole marrying the country idea though. Back in the medieval age, when someone became queen, they had to get married more than once. For them, it wasn't just about marrying their spouse, they also had to marry their country. This process was called consecration, and it was something that a ruler had to go through in order to be a legitimate queen. The queen would go through a symbolic marriage to the realm, complete with prayers and a blessing and a ring and a crown. It was essentially like a real wedding, except the groom was a nation of people. Sounds like a happy marriage to me. Yes. At number two, long distance marriage. You know how during the pandemic, people started having Zoom weddings? Well, in a way, people have been doing something similar since the medieval ages. Back then, a lot of weddings were simply for political reasons, and so a big ceremony was rarely needed. So when two people from different kingdoms were getting married, they didn't necessarily need to be there for the wedding. Instead, they could send proxies and have someone marry their new spouse on their behalf. This would be the legal binding of marriage, you know, the paperwork side of things. But once both parties could finally meet in person, then they would hold a second ceremony with all the pomp and circumstance that you would expect. And yes, it still included the whole watching the consummation thing. Ew. This proxy marriage actually happened to Marie Antoinette and her brother was her proxy until she could get to the formal ceremony. So now we know that even back then you didn't have to show up on time to your own wedding and you could just get someone else to do it. Sounds a little cold to me, but like I've said before, love is dead and it died a long time ago. Mic drop, thank you. Number one, last but not least, and this is the most messed up, the Lord's Right. This one is definitely the most messed up tradition and I don't even know how it was justified in the first place. Like why was it even in place? Someone clearly clearly made this happen so they could piss people off. The last thing anyone wants at their wedding is someone interfering with the wedding night. As we know, people for the most part had to observe the 
ceremony, but the Lord's Rite was something even more horrific. The Droit de Seigneur was a feudal rite that existed in medieval Europe that gave the Lord of the land the right to sleep with the bride on the first night of the marriage. That's right, so most often they would take the bride's virginity. Now just how often this rite was carried through is debated, but if your lord had a particular vendetta against you, it wouldn't be surprising. This rite could also extend to a lord taking the virginity of every woman in the village, even if they didn't want to get married. It was ridiculous. However, late Middle Age and Renaissance era texts don't clearly determine whether this practice ever occurred. Texts from 15th century Switzerland references the Lord of Mar demanding the rite of the first night or a hefty fee. So either you pay for it, or I do it. The Dois de Seigneur was depicted in Mel Gibson's Braveheart, which added to the infamy of the idea, but no physical evidence determines whether any lord actually did it, but it did technically exist. Gross.